Hi, it's Katrina. The Sauter Children. On what seemed like a normal Christmas Eve in 1945 in Fayetteville, West Virginia, couple George and Jenny Sauter and their nine kids went to bed, eager for Christmas morning. A fire broke out around 1 o'clock a.m., and George, Jenny, and four of the kids escaped. George tried saving the other five children, Maurice, Martha, Louis, Jenny, and Betty, by breaking a window, but he couldn't see inside the smoky house. They vanished seemingly into thin air and were never seen or heard from again. Due to communication issues, the fire department did not reach the scene until 8 in the morning, by which point the house was completely destroyed. But traces of the five missing kids' remains were never found, and they were presumed dead, based on the theory that the blaze completely cremated their remains. Still, with no signs of remains whatsoever, George and Jenny began to wonder if their children had somehow escaped the fire, and if so, what had happened to them? The fire itself, which was attributed to faulty wiring, also raised questions, since the wiring had recently been installed and inspected, and was in perfect working order as far as the couple knew. In the months leading up to the fire, numerous strange people had appeared at and near the Sauter's home, including an angry insurance salesman who said that the house was going to go up in smoke, and a stranger looking for work who pointed at the boxes containing the wiring and said that they were going to catch fire someday. After the tragic incident, Jenny began her own investigation and learned that it was highly unlikely that the fire had burned her children's bodies to the point of leaving no bones behind. Even more curiously, people claimed to see the missing children after the fire, including a waitress who served them breakfast before they rode off in a car with Florida license plates. Witnesses said that the kids were accompanied by adult men who would not let the children interact with anyone while out in public. The Sodders spent years trying to convince the authorities to reopen the case, believing that their children had been kidnapped, but they adamantly refused, leaving the couple on their own to investigate leads. Time and time again, their search turned up fruitless. George and Jenny Sodder died without ever learning what happened to their five vanished children, but with the certainty that they did not die in the Christmas Eve house fire. Cryptic Cop Killer on September 7, 1959, Officer Douglas Eugene Cantrell of the Davis, California Police Department was killed in the line of duty near a railroad track in a residential part of town. A young couple discovered his slain body in his patrol car, which was still running with its lights on. Officer Cantrell was sitting in the front seat with his legs hanging out the open door, a single bullet through the heart, and his 38 caliber pistol on the ground. After joining the department just a month earlier, the 23-year-old patrolman became the first and only Davis Police Department officer ever killed on the job, a distinction he holds to this day. Both suicide and accidental causes were ruled out, but investigators failed to procure any witness accounts of the incident or any suspicious activity in the area. Nobody was ever charged in Officer Cantrell's death, despite several suspects being questioned and given polygraphs. One individual who spoke with detectives changed the story of his whereabouts on the night of the murder, making him look even more suspicious, but there was no evidence linking him to the crime. Meanwhile, a Louisiana prisoner named Emmett Spencer attempted to implicate his girlfriend, Mary Catherine Hampton, in Officer Cantrell's murder, but he was probably lying as evidence showed that Hampton was in Florida when the killing occurred. The cold case was still open on its 53rd anniversary in 2012, when Rich Rifkin covered it for the Davis Enterprise and was denied access to the case file. Unfortunately, the murder happened so long ago that anyone with information about the culprit, including the killer themselves, will likely take their secrets to the grave, if they haven't already. Number 7. Dyatlov Pass Incident a group of 10 young but experienced cross-country skiers trekked into the Ural Mountains near Yekaterinburg, Russia for what was supposed to be a three-week trip to Mount Ortorten. What happened to them remains one of the greatest mysteries of all time. They set up camp in a mountain pass and the leader of the expedition said that he'd telegram his sports club when they returned. Weeks and weeks passed and no sign, so a search party was sent out to find them. They came across a very disturbing scene. What exactly had happened, no one knows, but the rescuers found the tent slashed from the inside, as if the travelers had tried escaping suddenly, with their seemingly abandoned dinner nearby. Outside the tent were a series of footprints made by eight or nine people, who were either barefoot, in socks, or wearing one shoe. The footprints led to a nearby tree, where they found the remains of two people, 
Stripped of their clothes and wearing nothing but underwear, another three were spotted who seemed to have died from the cold, but there were no other injuries. Two months later, four more appeared in a ravine with significant injuries and signs of attack. Some had been mutilated or had parts missing. Some also had broken ribs, an oddly twisted neck, and a fractured skull. The only survivor was Yura Yudin, an economic scholar who experienced back pain early on in the trip and turned around in the nick of time. The official causes of death were declared to be hypothermia and frostbite. But what had really happened to the group? It was definitely not an animal attack or an avalanche that would take off their clothes and cause all of these bizarre injuries. People demanded answers regarding the suspicious deaths, but nobody was ever implicated, including the suspected military and the local Mansi tribe. In early 2019, the Russian government reopened its investigation into the incident, announcing plans to fly experts to the site where the bodies were discovered for forensic tests in an attempt to determine exactly what happened. Theories range from weapons testing carried out by the military to an encounter with an angry yeti, or for whatever reason, the group turned against each other like some type of Hunger Games. It's very hard to say for sure until perhaps some documents become declassified. What are your theories about this incident? What do you think happened to them? Let me know in the comments below. Mara Murray's Disappearance On February 9, 2004, 21-year-old nursing student Mara Murray packed up her dorm room belongings, withdrew cash from an ATM, and hit the road. She emailed one of her professors explaining that there was a death in the family, although there wasn't, and that she would be gone for a week. Her 1996 Saturn was found crashed into a tree in Woodsville, New Hampshire. A police officer at the scene wrote that evidence at the scene indicated that the vehicle had been eastbound and had run off the roadway, struck some trees, spun around, and come to rest facing the wrong way in the eastbound lane. Although it was no mystery that Mara's car had crashed, she was nowhere to be found. It was cold outside, and the ground was covered in snow. A local bus driver who witnessed the crash told police that the young lady behind the wheel came out and told him not to report it, that she already had. Not true. An empty wine box in the car and red stains indicated that alcohol played a role in the accident. Perhaps she panicked? The only other clues were a set of MapQuest directions to an apartment complex in Burlington, Vermont, along with a typed letter to her boyfriend about their relationship problems, which she left behind in her dorm room. No trace of Mora was found any further than 100 feet from the crash, leaving authorities with three primary theories. She got a ride, was abducted, or kept walking into the woods and somehow her scent was lost in the snow. Investigative journalist James Runner put forth the idea that Mara had someone pick her up and take her to Canada, where she started a new life. Renner believes that perhaps she was pregnant and ran off to escape her abusive boyfriend. Either way, it is very strange that she would just disappear without even telling her family. Mara's family is still searching for answers. Earlier this year, they launched a new website in her honor, maramurraymissing.org. The Havana Embassy Mystery In late 2016, CIA agents posing as American diplomats in Havana, Cuba, experienced an array of bizarre symptoms, including loud mechanical sounds akin to chirping crickets. The individuals were ultimately treated for hearing loss, nausea, headaches, and other concussion-like symptoms. FBI agents found no evidence of what happened. Meanwhile, theories of a long-range acoustic weapon prevailed. The so-called official conclusion was that those claiming to experience symptoms suffered from a condition called mass sociogenic illness, which is another term for mass hysteria. Cuban officials and the U.S. State Department squabbled back and forth about whether the bizarre condition was indeed a psychological condition or something else. One study posited that the patients exhibited symptoms of having suffered from military-induced or car accident-related effects. It's like a concussion without a concussion, wrote co-author Randall Swanson. Since there was never any proof of any type of sound weapon or anything like that, the incident was used as an excuse to scale back on former President Barack Obama's moves to lessen tensions and open up diplomatic relations between the U.S. and Cuba. But no agency has conclusively determined who or what was behind this strange incident, leaving the rest of the country and the world to wonder what caused at least 22 individuals to be diagnosed with the bizarre symptoms? What happened to the American diplomats in Cuba? Nobody knows. Sleeping Sickness Epidemic Starting in the winter of 1916 to 1917, a strange neurological sickness called encephalitis lethargica began spreading across Europe and eventually elsewhere. 
It's estimated that over 1 million people were afflicted with the condition during this unexplainable period, which lasted into the 1930s. It's believed that the sleeping sickness started in Romania and spread throughout the continent, moving especially efficiently via traveling soldiers during World War I. In 1917, after hitting Vienna, it became an epidemic, and it accompanied the Spanish flu in 1918. One theory holds that a rare strain of Streptococcus bacteria causes sleeping sickness by attacking the brain, but experts remain at a loss for an explanation for why people suffer from the disease and its strange symptoms which include being essentially frozen in a state of lethargy, along with fever, headache, and double vision. Other side effects include abnormal eye movements, upper body weakness, muscular pain, tremors, hallucinations, and in acute cases, patients sometimes even enter a coma. To add to the mystery, the illness seemed to go away for a period of time, only to reappear in Europe decades later during the 1950s, in the US during the 60s, and about 10 years ago in China, when a young girl was hospitalized for several weeks. Dr. Oliver Sachs, who treated patients in the Bronx, described them as seemingly insubstantial as ghosts and as passive as zombies. During past outbreaks, victims were usually between 10 and 45 years old, and while one-third of them perished from the disease, many, if not most, survivors never returned to normal. Even more terrifyingly, there was also an apparent tendency for patients to come down with Parkinson's disease after suffering from sleeping sickness. The medical community's knowledge of the disease is perhaps limited by the small windows of time and opportunities they had to study it. Will sleeping sickness reappear? Let's hope not. Romans in Brazil In 1982, a marine archaeologist named Robert Marx discovered around 200 intact Roman jars, or amphorae, on the seafloor about 15 miles off the shore of Brazil's Guanabara Bay. The presence of amphorae, which were used as shipping containers, often indicates that a Roman shipwreck is nearby, leading to the shocking idea that the ancient Romans may have reached the Americas hundreds of years before the earliest European explorers were known to arrive there. The Brazilian government was hesitant to investigate the matter, and Marx speculated that this could be because the country did not want to challenge the historical narrative due to its long-standing ties with Portugal because the artifacts in question appear to date back to the second century BC, if proven authentic, they stand to upend the story that the Portuguese were the first Europeans in Brazil. But it's unlikely that answers will ever be found as long as the government maintains its current stance on the matter. A year after Marx found the jars, further exploration of the area was banned, supposedly to deter looters, and the policy remains in effect to this day. The Pollock Sisters in 1957, sisters Joanna and Jacqueline Pollock tragically died when they were hit by a car in the small English town of Hexham. A year after the accident, their devastated parents went on to have twin girls, named Gillian and Jennifer. John, the twins' father, had predicted that Joanna and Jacqueline would be reborn through their new children, and at first, his wife Florence was skeptical of this idea. From the beginning of their lives, however, the twins showed distinct signs of John's prediction being true. For example, there was a white line across Jennifer's forehead in the same exact spot where Jacqueline had a scar, and Jennifer also had the same birthmark as her deceased sister. As the girls grew, they resembled their older sisters more and more in both their looks and mannerisms. It's easy to chalk these similarities up to a case of grieving parents desperately looking for signs of the children they lost somehow still being there, but some of the twins' abilities cannot be explained rationally including one incident where they visited the town where the deadly crash had occurred and were able to identify landmarks that their older sisters had been familiar with, even though the family had moved away when they were babies. Jillian and Jennifer also identified and correctly named dolls and other toys that had belonged to Joanna and Jacqueline. Perhaps the most disturbing sign of reincarnation that the twins experienced were the nightmares of car crashes that plagued them and their complete fear of idling cars. After the girls turned five years old, this and other occurrences that had made their parents believe that they were their older sisters reborn became less frequent. The twins went on to live normal lives, leaving the world to wonder if they were truly a case of reincarnation, or if lots of little coincidences added up to paint this picture for their mourning parents. A Vanished Family When the swimming pool belonging to the Salomons, a Northridge, California family of four, overflowed and spilled into the neighbor's yard in 1982, Nearby residents realized that the home's occupants had vanished. They alerted the police, who found blood spatter and a cutaway piece of carpet in the bedroom of 14-year-old daughter Michelle, indicating the teen had met foul play. 
but DNA analysis was not readily available like it is now, and with no obvious signs of what happened to the Salomons, the authorities classified their disappearance as a missing persons case. Documents and personal effects belonging to some of the family members subsequently turned up in strange places, including a freeway 15 miles from their home. Over the next decade, numerous theories turned up, including allegations that missing husband and father Sol Salomon was involved in the Israeli mafia or some other criminal activity that ended in fatal violence. But actual evidence pointing to what happened to the family remained scarce. The night before anyone realized the Salomons were missing, Sol supposedly attended a car auction and ate at a restaurant with a business partner, whose story was fraught with inconsistencies and red flags, including the fact that the diner they supposedly visited was actually closed that night. The business partner was arrested, but there wasn't enough evidence for a conviction and he walked free, with his guilt remaining doubtful to this day. Investigators failed to procure solid enough evidence to nab any other suspects in the case, which remains unsolved to this day. Vosros Denia Island The BBC called this island the deadly germ warfare island abandoned by the Soviets. This place is something out of a horror film, but it is actually real. During the Cold War, the Soviet Union used Vosrosdenia Island as a top-secret testing ground for deadly Soviet pathogens designed to wreak havoc when necessary. In the 1950s, the Soviet Union built a biological weapons test site called Aralsk-7 to perform all kinds of mysterious inventions and tests. The island was the perfect place, secluded and surrounded by a desert on the Kazakh-Uzbek border, thus ensuring that any outbreaks would hopefully be destroyed by the natural heat. The BBC reports that aerial photographs taken by the CIA in 1962 revealed that while other islands had piers and fish packing huts, this one had a rifle range, barracks, and a parade ground. But that wasn't even the half of it. There were also research buildings, animal pens, and an open-air testing site. Bozrosdenia Island used to be small, but in the 1960s, it started to swell up to 10 times its original size. As the Soviets diverted the water from the sea to somewhere else, here there was everything. The plague, anthrax, smallpox, brucellosis, tularemia, botulinum, and all kinds of other diseases with names that are difficult to pronounce. They would then modify this strain so that they couldn't be treated with the vaccines available at the time. Since the 1970s, there have been a series of sinister events reported around the island when mountains of fish started dying. Crew on a vessel that got too close to the island got smallpox, even though they had already been vaccinated, and two fishermen appeared to have died from the plague. This project was such a big secret, the place doesn't appear on any maps. It wasn't until later in the 1990s that an official expedition went to see exactly how bad it was. It was bad. There was an anthrax leak and over 100 people died. 200 tons of the stuff had been gathered and buried on the island, but spores can live on for years. There were pits with infected animals, dangerous materials and containers all over the place, and it took millions of dollars to clean it up. The place is still highly contaminated with carcinogenic pesticides and mercury, and reportedly there are no signs of life anywhere. It is not an easy place to get to, and it is not a place where you can just show up. Diego Garcia Military Base Situated just 7 degrees south of the equator in the central Indian Ocean, Diego Garcia is an atoll of the Chagos Archipelago. It became part of the British Indian Ocean Territory, or Bayat, in 1965, and its population and function changed dramatically over the following years. Until 1967, the 924 civilians living on Diego Garcia were nearly all employed as contract workers on coconut farms, owned by the Chagos Agalega Company. That year, the Bayat administration bought out Chagos Agalega and leased the land back to the company, but the corporation terminated its lease at the end of the year. From 1968 to 1973, the UK government forcibly relocated Diego Garcia citizens, sending many people to Mauritius and the Seychelles with little to no consideration for where they wanted to live. Despite the island being owned by the British, the US military built a large naval and military base there, and it remains in operation to this day, serving as one of two critical US bomber bases in the Asia-Pacific region, as well as a launch pad for military operations in the Middle East and a refueling station for South China Sea-bound US Air Force patrols. Between 3,000 and 5,000 service members and contractors live on Diego Garcia, but ordinary civilians are prohibited from visiting. 
The territory is currently embroiled in an ongoing tug of war, with the United Nations highest court ruling in September 2019 that the British illegally seized Diego Garcia from its rightful inhabitants. But the ruling is not binding, and the U.S. military is reluctant to vacate the premises due to its strategic importance. It would take a lot more than that to leave an important military base. The goings-on at Diego Garcia are kept under tight wraps. No journalist has ever visited the island, and not even military spouses can come to visit. It's practically a miracle we've ever even heard about it. The World's Most Isolated Tribe North Sentinel Island is home to a virtually uncontacted tribe known to aggressively resist outsiders. Located in the Bay of Bengal, the island is part of the Andaman and Nicobar Islands archipelago and is a territory of India. Experts know very little about the Sentinelese people due to their long-established history of violently rejecting attempts at contact from the outside world. It is estimated the tribe has been around for 30,000 years and has lived in near-complete isolation, speaking a language that nobody else in the world knows. The Sentinelese have attacked nearly everyone who has tried approaching them, even killing several individuals. They are so hostile, authorities have even decided against trying to retrieve the bodies of slain outsiders to avoid further violence. Nobody knows why the Sentinelese are so quick to attack, although a good guess is they simply want to be left alone. Perhaps they have received a warning of some kind, or somehow know that it's most likely that bad things will happen if outsiders come. Their self-imposed seclusion probably benefits them because they have no natural immunity or resistance to many modern diseases, and sicknesses that most patients now survive could easily kill an entire tribe. For their safety, as well as the safety of others, in 1956 the Indian government implemented legislation banning visitors from going within five nautical miles of the place. Only a select handful of professionals have been allowed there since, including Indian anthropologist Triloknath Pandit, whose team established the first and only peaceful interaction with the Sentinelese in 1991. But some people have ignored the ban against visiting with deadly consequences. The most recent case happened in 2018, when a 26-year-old American Christian missionary named John Chow paid fishermen to illegally ferry him to the island. Chow knew the dangers associated with going near the Sentinelese, but he was so intent on spreading Christianity to the tribe, even though he didn't know their language and they don't speak English, and he had no one to vouch for him. He tried repeatedly to reach shore in a kayak and was attacked with arrows each time, forcing Chow to retreat back to the fisherman's boat. Eventually, the men who ferried the missionary saw the man had died. The fishermen who helped Chow reach the off-limits island were arrested and charged for their crimes, but the Indian government does not prosecute the Sentinelese for killing invaders. Coming here continues to be forbidden for everyone's safety. Bishop Rock Lighthouse The world's smallest island with a building on it is Bishop Rock, a scary or a small rocky island in the westernmost part of the Isles of Scilly archipelago, which is located 28 miles off the southwestern tip of Great Britain's Cornish Peninsula. Measuring just 151 feet long by 52 feet wide, it's just big enough for the lighthouse that stands on it. The Bishop Rock Lighthouse was built in the 18th century to warn vessels of the Scilly Isles and the dangerous surrounding rocks, which had caused many shipwrecks. The first attempt at constructing the lighthouse failed when the tremendously strong winds the area is known for knocked the structure right over and into the sea. Builders resorted to erecting a granite tower, which withstood the elements far more successfully. It was completed in 1858, and in 1976, a helipad was installed on the roof. The lighthouse actually had a keeper living there until 1992, around which time it switched to automatic lighting technology. Today, its 10 floors are capable of accommodating up to four visitors who stay for one to three weeks at a time. So while it's not exactly forbidden, the Bishop Rock Lighthouse isn't in the most hospitable environment, and trips there are often canceled. It was one of the most hazardous and difficult sites ever to build a lighthouse. Vis Submarine Tunnels The island of Vis in Croatia is not only beautiful, but has quite the military past. During World War II, the Germans took control of the strategically important island and built numerous structures, including a submarine base, as well as a secret underground tunnel and cave network. There are over 35 known places that were built for military purposes. Afterwards, it fell to Yugoslavia and became a very important place for leader Josip Broz Tito, who repurposed the Nazis' left-behind structures on Vis into a military base for his communist army. 
In the middle of the island, there was a large cannon and missile base to protect it from attack. This was closed to foreign visitors until sometime after 1989, when the breakup of Yugoslavia began to take hold. Around the same time, Tito's military abandoned its base on the island. Even for a while, there were parts on the island you could not go, including a large submarine dock, now a popular place for sneaky yachts. Locals were desperate for the military to leave so they could finally open the island to foreigners. Besides guided tours through the once forbidden military structures, you might recognize this island as the location where Mamma Mia! Here We Go Again was filmed. Bizarre Base In late 2018, Finnish authorities raided Sakiluoto, a small privately owned island belonging to a Russian businessman from St. Petersburg named Pavel Melnikov. Leo Gastgivar, a retiree who lives on a neighboring island within the archipelago, which sits between Sweden and Finland, was shocked when he witnessed the commandos approaching Sakiluoto in black speedboats. I thought, wow, that is certainly unusual, Gastgivar told the New York Times. Nobody ever visits that place. Melnikov took the security of his island seriously, covering it with surveillance cameras and no trespassing signs. Even more suspiciously, Sakiluoto had nine piers, a helipad, a swimming pool covered in camouflage netting, and a large amount of housing, all equipped with satellite dishes, according to New York Times reporter Andrew Higgins. Authorities claim that they conducted the raid, along with 16 others that day, out of suspicion of financial crimes, including money laundering and pension and tax fraud. But some believe that there is more to the story, including the possibility that the Russian military had something to do with the operations at Melnikov's property. The coordinated bust involved 400 officers, the region's airspace was closed to any aircraft not associated with the raid, and all the properties that authorities visited had suspected links to Russia. Russian Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev denied such allegations, stating at a press conference following the raid, I don't know in whose sick mind such a thought could be formulated. Such thinking is paranoid. Is it though? Russia's not really known for being upfront, but hey. The neighbor said, I've been thinking for many years that they are doing something military over there, he said. Building, 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 but nobody knows what for. But the Finnish authorities remained quiet regarding exactly what they found at Sakiluoto and the other islands they visited that day. The country has a long-standing history of avoiding tensions with Russia, leaving the world to wonder if the bus represented a rare effort on behalf of the Finnish government to put its foot down and what it discovered in the process. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. Secret Testing Facility Starting in 1942, during World War II, Scotland's Grunard Island became a top-secret testing facility for biological weapons. The UK government used the small, uninhabited island, located in the Scottish Highlands, for experimenting with a deadly bacteria called Volum 14578, which they packed into bombs and tested on innocent, unsuspecting flocks of sheep. The general takeaway from the project was that the substance was, without a doubt, capable of contaminating entire German cities for decades. Consequently, as the site where the tests occurred, Greenard Island itself became poisoned, and it stayed that way for nearly 50 years. During the early 1980s, an organization called Operation Dark Harvest mailed toxic soil samples from the island to various British government agencies, demanding that they clean up the tainted territory. The government began doing so in 1986 by spraying a formaldehyde and seawater mixture on Greenard Island, and in 1990, the toxic property was officially declared safe. Documents regarding the history of what went on there were declassified in 1997, making the shady situation available to the public for the first time. Following the decontamination efforts, a flock of sheep was left on the island, and none of them have tested positive for the poison since 2007. But some people believe that Grunard Island could still be toxic and are unwilling to take their chances by going anywhere near it. Torpedo Testing Station Torpedovnia is an abandoned German torpedo testing station that was left over after World War II. Located in the Baltic Sea's Bay of Puck, roughly 1,000 feet off the remote coast of Gdynia, Poland, it consists of a torpedo launcher and two smaller buildings, and in between there was a torpedo scavenging net. The World War II-era launch station, which was officially named the Kriegsmarine Submarine Arms Research Center, was only used for its original intended purpose for around three years, between 1942 and 1945. After the war ended, Germany was partitioned between the US, the UK, and the Soviet Union via the Potsdam Agreement. 
Meanwhile, Torbodovnia and its environs were returned to Poland, which fell under Soviet authority. The Soviet military continued to use the man-made island for training military divers, but eventually deserted the site, taking its technical equipment back to the USSR. Tarbodovnia subsequently fell into disrepair, and a long wooden pier that once connected the complex to the shore was blown up to deter explorers from trying to reach the site. Today, parts of the deteriorated station have fallen into the sea, and the structure seems to be on the verge of collapse. The site is unsupervised and therefore accessible to visitors, but it's also unstable, and explorers are advised to proceed with caution. If you are a good swimmer, you can also get there that way, but it's probably not the best place to spend the day. Protected Wildlife The Farallon Islands are located 28 miles off the San Francisco shore, so close they can easily be seen on a clear day. Consisting of four groups of islands spanning a 211-acre area, the closest most people ever get to the Farallon Islands involves passing by them during a boat tour, as they are close to the public to protect wildlife. The stretch of water between San Francisco and the rocky cluster of islands is known for being cold, turbulent, and teeming with sharks. And because of these dangers, many people refuse to even go near the Farallon Islands. In 2012, for example, five out of eight crew members perished when their yacht crashed into rocks and capsized during the annual Full Crew Farallones boat race. Sail Magazine editor Kimball Livingston told the San Francisco Chronicle following the tragedy, even a Navy SEAL would feel panic in that situation. I'm surprised anyone survived. Anyone crazy enough to try sneaking onto the islands is doomed to fail. The treacherous, rocky coastlines prevent vessels from simply sailing up to the coastline. Researchers who visit the island transfer from a large boat to a smaller one, which is then lifted onto the island by a crane. There are two houses on southeast Farallon which house researchers and scientists who monitor the island's wildlife population trends. The islands are home to the largest nesting seabird colony in the U.S., and often serve as a waypoint for bird species from other regions who become lost during migration. In 2015, marathon swimmer Kim Chambers became the first woman and the fifth person ever to swim from the Farallones to the Golden Gate Bridge. She was aware of the dangers ahead of time, as she later recalled. I was prepared not to come back, Chambers said. I did my laundry because I wanted my place to be decent when they came to collect my stuff. Thankfully, she survived the swim, arriving at the Golden Gate Bridge 17 hours and 12 minutes after diving in. Last Paradise The Mergui Archipelago of Myanmar, or formerly Burma, is a chain of over 800 largely uncharted, mostly uninhabited islands, some of which are home to the Mokin, a tribe of seafaring nomads who live off what they catch in the ocean. They sleep in boats and live a hunter-gatherer lifestyle. Instead of using modern equipment, the Mokin use small nets and spears. They are also known as people of the water, or sea gypsies. Their philosophy is to have a minimal impact on the environment and that natural resources cannot be owned individually. They share the pristine territory with numerous rare mammal, bird, and marine species. Estimates put the Mokin population at anywhere from a few hundred to 3,000, and they speak a unique language that is unknown to the outside world. But the Mokin's population is declining and their environment is threatened. For decades, the Burmese government prohibited the public from visiting the Mergui Islands. Tourism began during the 1990s, but the worst damage came starting in 2011, when authorities began accepting development proposals from investors. Today, the islands are increasingly being encroached upon by tourists, entrepreneurs, loggers, fishermen, and others seeking to capitalize from the Mergui Archipelago's vast natural resources and beauty. The Begging Bowl The Begging Bowl is an ornately carved skull used in Tibet. Also called a kapala, it is used for special rituals and to place offerings. This one is a highly decorated and gilded monkey skull. Tibetan monks once used all types of skulls, including those of humans, to appease angry spirits, using them as offering plates for wine, bread, and even blood, which was believed to drive the evil spirits away from the holy place. During the 1950s, a man brought the begging bowl with him to the United States. He regularly fed wine and blood to the skull to avoid feeling tormented by the artifact. He stored it in a locked box with a special knife drawer on the bottom. Rumor says that he and his family made sure to always feed the bowl to perpetuate his family's good fortune. If not, the spirit would get angry and harm would come to them. 
The begging bowl's age is unknown, and its owner passed it down to his grandson who neglected to feed the skull as his grandfather had. Then at some point, the knife in the lower drawer disappeared. The skull's new owner began sensing a heavy electric air around the artifact, and it made him incredibly uneasy. To distance himself from the begging bowl, he donated it to the Traveling Museum of the Paranormal and the Occult, owned by paranormal investigators Dana and Greg Newkirk. I don't blame him for not wanting that thing in the house, do you? The Hands Resist Him Created by artist Bill Stoneham in 1972, The Hands Resist Him is a painting depicting a boy and girl doll standing beside one another in front of a glass door. From behind the door, several hands are pressed up against the glass, leaving eerie shadows as if they were trying to reach the children. The boy in the painting is Stoneham's depiction of himself as a five-year-old, and the doorway represents the line dividing the living world and the realm of fantasies and impossibilities. Actor John Marley, who played Jack Waltz in The Godfather, owned The Hands Resist Him before it ended up for sale on eBay in February 2000. The elderly California couple selling the painting had found it at the site of an old brewery. Their listing implies that the artwork was haunted or cursed, stating that the characters moved within the painting during the night, and that they even exited the painting from time to time. The sellers even posted photos that they cited as evidence of the girl in the painting threatening the little boy with a gun. A disclaimer at the bottom of the listing absolved the sellers of all liability after a new owner purchased it. The listing garnered over 30,000 views, and the painting sold to the Perception Gallery in Grand Rapids, Michigan for a winning bid of $1,025. The gallery reached out to Stoneham, who was surprised about all the stories of his work being haunted. But the rumors proved beneficial when he was commissioned to paint several sequels and a prequel to The Hands Resist Him. The images supposedly showing a gun in the little girl's hands are, according to Stoneham, a dry cell battery and tangled wires. While the artist seemed doubtful that his painting was haunted, he did admit that the gallery owner where it was first displayed and the art critic that reviewed it both died within a year of going near it. Busby's Stoop Chair A haunted oak chair known as the Busby's Stoop Chair and the Dead Man's Chair is reportedly responsible for so many deaths, its owner had to get rid of it and donated it to the Thirsk Museum in England. It all started in 1702 in North Yorkshire when Thomas Busby, a thief and a drunkard, had an argument with his father-in-law. They were both petty criminals, and for whatever reason, Busby just couldn't take it anymore and killed him. The story goes that Busby always drank at the same tavern and sat in his favorite chair, and that day, his father-in-law decided to sit in it. Regardless of what really happened, Busby was sentenced to hang. But before then, he was allowed one last drink at his favorite tavern. The story goes that there, he cursed the chair and yelled that whoever sat in it would die soon after. He was hung near the inn which was renamed the Busby Stoop Inn. He is said to haunt the inn and the surrounding area, and apparently he made sure that no one would sit in his chair, even from the grave. During World War II, some Canadian airmen who were stationed nearby stopped into the pub. They later claimed that anyone who sat in the chair throughout the night never returned from subsequent bombing missions. A construction worker was dared to sit in the chair by his friends, and he fell through a roof and died later that day. A delivery man asked about the legend and sat in the chair, and later that night, he died in a car crash. Other airmen from the nearby base would stop by the pub, sit in the famous chair on purpose, defying the curse, and then later died in accidents. The curse persisted into the 1970s, and in 1978, the owner gave it up to the Thirsk Museum. People who had followed the legend said that the chair had claimed 63 lives. The owner explicitly asked them to hang the chair so that no one could sit in it ever, and the story goes that the museum has never broken its promise. Do you believe in the haunted chair? Would you dare to sit in it? Let me know in the comments below. And be sure to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Ruby A haunted baby doll named Ruby came to the traveling museum of the paranormal and the occult from a family who had treasured her for generations as an heirloom. During Ruby's time spent with her original owners, they became convinced that the doll was causing their children to suffer from chronic illnesses. Their little girl passed away from tuberculosis with Ruby in her arms, and whenever other family members went near the doll, they experienced symptoms such as headaches, allergies, exhaustion, and severe nausea. 
Ruby also seemed to move around on her own and made eerie sounds, according to the family, who began believing that their deceased daughter's spirit had attached itself to the toy. They summoned a psychic medium for help, encouraging the spirit to move on, but the efforts failed, and Ruby was passed around from one family household to another, ultimately ending up in an attic and then finally at the museum. Many psychics believe that dolls are perfect empty shells for spirits to inhabit, so it's not good to have too many of them. For a while, Ruby sat on a shelf. Suddenly, however, visitors began feeling overwhelmed by maternal urges near her and would hold the doll, rocking her back and forth. Ruby still seems to have this effect on people, and thankfully, she no longer causes anyone to become sick. She is both sweet and creepy. Do you like dolls, or do you think they're kind of scary? Let me know in the comments below. The Crying Boy the curse of the crying boy began during the 1950s, when Italian painter Giovanni Bragolini created a series of portraits of a tearful little boy in honor of World War II orphans. These paintings were popular in England, where they were mass-produced and sold throughout the country. In September 1985, news broke of a couple named Ron and Mary Hall losing their home to a fire, with their copy of the crying boy painting being the only item to survive. Peter Hall, Ron's brother and a firefighter, claimed that he had been to many fires where everything but the crying boy was destroyed. People responded overwhelmingly to the news article, and mass hysteria ensued. The next morning alone, hundreds of readers had contacted the newspaper with their own stories of the crying boy painting remaining intact after a devastating fire. Some claimed that the artwork had even killed a loved one, while others said that they tried burning it and it wouldn't catch fire. Not everyone bought into this superstition, including Alan Wilkinson, a firefighter who blamed the repeated fires on carelessness, while he also admitted to attending over 50 crying boy blazes since 1973. In response to the widespread panic, Calvin McKenzie, editor of The Sun at the time, told readers to send their crying boy paintings into the publication. While some people claimed that the artwork would not light on fire, newspaper staff had no problem burning over 2,500 copies that Halloween. The hysteria eventually died down, but the curse of the crying boy remained very much alive and well to some, and many still wonder if it's real. James Dean's Car On September 30, 1955, actor James Dean died in a car crash while driving his Porsche 550 Spider, which he affectionately called Little Bastard. He had purchased the car and had it customized just a week earlier. That day, the actor drove his new ride to a Los Angeles restaurant, where he dined with his friend, British actor Alec Guinness. Guinness, a superstitious man by nature, later wrote in his diary that the car looked sinister to him and that a voice inside of him told him never to get into the vehicle. Dean laughed at the idea of his car being inherently evil, and on the day of his death, he and his friend Rolf Wutherich went to Competition Motors in Hollywood to prepare Little Bastard for an upcoming race in Salina. Dean had experience in auto racing and had even competed himself. The pair decided to drive the car to Selena to break it in, and while rolling along at 85 miles per hour, after already receiving one speeding ticket, Dean crashed the Porsche into a Ford. He was just 24 years old. The crash killed Dean, and his wrecked car was sold to a man named George Barris for $2,500. The car itself, as well as its parts, which were used for building other cars, were connected with numerous accidents, causing serious injuries and at least two deaths. Naturally, the superstition emerged that the Porsche was cursed. Its twisted heap of debris was used in numerous safety exhibits, including one in Miami in 1960. Then the wreckage and the truck towing it vanished and were never seen again. Bassano Vase The dark tale of a 15th century silver vase called the Bassano Vase started when a bride in Napoli, Italy received it as a wedding gift, but she never made it to the altar. Legend goes that someone murdered her on her wedding night with the vase in her hands. The Bassano vase was passed down through the woman's family, and everyone who owned it seemed to die unexpectedly. Eventually, one of the owners put the vase in the ground, presumably to distance themselves from the evil artifact as much as possible. The artifact reappeared centuries later, in 1988, when a young man supposedly dug it up wherever its previous owners had buried it, at a location that has never been named specifically. Kind of like Jumanji. It was accompanied by a note stating, Beware, this vase brings death. 
It was auctioned off at an undisclosed auction house with the note left out of its description. I mean, who wants to buy a haunted vase on purpose? It was sold for $2,250 to an unnamed pharmacist, who died less than three months later. Three of the vase's subsequent owners reportedly died tragically. Nobody knows exactly what happened to the allegedly cursed object. Legend holds that its last owner threw it out a window in a desperate attempt to get away from it, and the vase fell onto a police officer below. The individual was fined for littering and gladly paid the fine but wanted nothing to do with the vase. Police attempted to place it in a museum but failed because no establishments wanted to risk being subjected to its curse. Someone supposedly buried the vase again at an undisclosed location where it remains today. The Hope Diamond However beautiful and valuable it may be, the Hope Diamond has a sinister past that includes a reputation for causing death and misfortune to many of its former owners. The 45.52 carat gem, worth an estimated $200 to $350 million, was likely mined in India, then traveled around the world and through numerous hands before ultimately ending up at the Smithsonian Natural History Museum, where it resides today. The alleged curse started when a thief stole the diamond out of a statue and suffered a gruesome death. Over the years, those who owned or even touched the Hope Diamond could count on experiencing any number of misfortunes, including divorce, suicide, torture, insanity, financial ruin, decapitation, loss of children, or some other form of torture or death. The diamond was held by the French royal family for a very long time until the French Revolution. Louis XIV and Marie Antoinette were said to be victims of the curse. It was then stolen and reappeared in England. The later owners were oblivious to the curse until it was too late, with one getting killed and another mauled by dogs. Harry Winston, the gem's final owner, dedicated it to the Smithsonian in 1958, and the curse seems to have ended there. Even though it's worth hundreds of millions of dollars, he apparently decided to send the stone through the mail. Some speculate that the curse was a made-up story meant to increase the Hope Diamond's value, a strategy that is known to be used from time to time. But if you take one look at this magnificent rock, it's hard to believe that anyone ever thought it needed help proving its worth. The fantastic history, size, and cut speak for itself. The Anguished Man Considered to be one of the world's most haunted artifacts, a frightening oil painting called The Anguished Man was created by an unknown artist and at an unknown time, allegedly using paint with human blood mixed into it. The painting ended up in the hands of a North England man named Sean Robinson, who got it from his grandmother after a friend had given it to her. Robinson's wife disliked the painting, so for some time he kept it in their basement. Finally, in 2010, he brought it upstairs and moved it into the bedroom. Robinson has had the painting for over three decades, but it was then that his family started experiencing the painting's haunting effects. They claim that it makes terrifying noises during the night, including groans, screams, and what sounds like the fabric tearing. The family has also witnessed a shadowy figure in their home and heard whispers and crying. Some people accuse the Robinsons of making up the story about the artwork in a bid to gain fame, but even many who doubt the credibility of their story would admittedly never take their chances by hanging it in their home. Would you? Woman of Lem the Woman of Lem, also called the Goddess of Death, is a small, pure limestone statue that was unearthed in Cyprus in 1878. It's one of hundreds of similar statues of varying sizes and shapes that have been found on the island, but oddly, there is no archaeological record of the excavation of the Woman of Lem statue, including who found it. The artifact earned its nickname as the Goddess of Death due to the numerous fatalities it's been connected to over the years. Its first owner, a man named Lord Elfont, passed away within six years of coming into possession of it, and several of his family members also died. The family of another owner, Ivor Minucci, died within four years of owning the statue. Lord Thompson Noel, the third owner, had the same thing happen. The last owners of the statue donated it to the Royal Scottish Museum in Edinburgh, where the curator who handled it died less than a year later. It remains in a glass display case in the museum to this day, where it seems to be kept at a safe enough distance from people to cause further harm. Titan Triggerfish These fish have teeth and big puffy lips that almost look human. The large triggerfish species, known as the Titan Triggerfish, is found in lagoons throughout the Indo-Pacific region. This seemingly harmless fish is highly territorial and quick to become aggressive, 
and it doesn't always need a reason to act. That's where trigger comes in. But also because they have a dorsal spine that can lock into place to anchor the fish into a crevice. Once the locking mechanism is triggered, it is almost impossible to get the fish out. There are numerous reports of triggerfish attacking divers without being provoked in any obvious way, and they are capable of inflicting some pretty serious injuries that often require medical attention. Take for example, resort manager Birgit Biggs Eggert, who required stitches to her upper lip as well as plastic surgery after a titan triggerfish charged at her face, seemingly out of nowhere, biting off a sizable chunk of lip, muscle, and nerves. It takes one look at the creature's mouth to understand how the fish can be so destructive. They can grow up to 30 inches long and are equipped with a mouthful of sharp, strong, and almost human-like teeth. Depending on the species, their teeth range in color from red to yellow. While they have very small mouths, they have powerful jaws with not just one row of teeth, but several. Why do they need such an overkill bite? They usually eat crustaceans and mollusks, so they need to be able to break through those tough shells. People sometimes keep these fish in aquariums because of their beautiful coloring. Just be careful if you are hand feeding. They have a lot of personality, but can also be quite the challenge. In the wild, divers like to go where they live, so be careful and make sure you know who's watching you while you are checking out the reefs. Dromedary Camel Some of the scariest animal teeth actually belong to herbivores. They have to be able to crush their food and also have a big bite to defend themselves. The dromedary camel is an example with teeth that can grow more than three inches long. And they aren't just for show. Although the species adheres to a vegetarian diet of dry grasses and vegetation, there are reports of dromedary camels turning on their owners. When camels attack, owners can sometimes even die. Their jaws are powerful enough to crush human bone. And for this reason, fatal bites are known to occur. In 2016, a camel owner in Rajasthan, India paid with his life for leaving the animal tied up in the sweltering heat all day long. Upon realizing that he had forgotten about the camel, he went back to release it, and the understandably angry creature became aggressive and attacked the man. You could kind of say it was revenge. A disturbed witness told the Times of India, the animal lifted him by the neck and threw him on the ground, chewed the body, and severed the head. It wasn't the first time that particular camel attacked its owner. In a previous incident, around 25 people reportedly had to work together to restrain the animal, and it took them around six hours to get the camel under control. While camels are typically gentle, they are known to become aggressive in the heat. Male camels also have a tendency to sometimes become aggressive. Generally speaking, however, camels and humans seem to usually get along just fine, as they have been domesticated for a very long time. Have you ever ridden a camel? Let me know in the comments below. I never have, but it looks fun. I'll just try to remember to stay away from its mouth. Leatherback Sea Turtle Who knew that a sea turtle would have such a scary mouth? The leatherback sea turtle is the world's third largest living reptile and the largest turtle. They can get up to 7 feet long and weigh up to 2,000 pounds. The leatherback sea turtle's mouth is filled with hundreds of spiky backward-facing teeth called papillae, which resemble stalactites. These terrifying-looking structures go all the way from its mouth, extending down to its esophagus and then to the stomach. The papillae have a deceptively vicious appearance that make the creature's mouth appear as if it's built to shred prey. But leatherback sea turtles exclusively prefer jellyfish. And the pointy, quote-unquote, teeth, along with an elongated esophagus that wraps around the turtle's stomach, help to prevent dinner from escaping. Once something gets stuck going in, it's stuck for good. No way a jellyfish is getting out of this one. These turtles are one of the few animals that can help keep jellyfish populations in check. Unfortunately, sea turtles have a hard time telling the difference between jellyfish and plastic bags, making plastic ingestion a serious problem for leatherback sea turtles. Saber-toothed deer Here's a cute little critter straight out of a Disney movie, but it has fangs. What happened? There are seven known species from the musk deer family, native to Russia and Asia, but some countries import them for hunting. Despite being called deer, these creatures are technically not deer because they lack antlers. But the most obvious and perhaps creepiest thing about them is that they have strangely out-of-place looking teeth, with males possessing two huge protruding fangs that jet out from their upper jaw. Why though? Although musk deer certainly look like they can do some damage with their teeth, these animals are herbivores. They use their fangs to deter, 
warn, and compete with rivals during mating season. Male musk deer are also known for the distinctive smelling substance they emit from a special gland near their hindquarters, which acts as an aphrodisiac during mating season. Oddly, humans also seem to enjoy this odor, as evidenced by the poaching problem that threatens musk deer populations, which have been hunted to incredibly low numbers. The scent glands are used for manufacturing perfume and in traditional medicine. Musk deer live solitary lives, for the most part, in remote and rocky habitats, and while they may look like a vampire, you don't have anything to fear. Strap-toothed whale From a distance, or at first glance, the strap-toothed whale looks like an ordinary cetacean, but a closer look will reveal that adult male specimens possess two long backward and inward curling tusks, which extend over the upper jaw and more or less almost wire its mouth shut. They can only open their mouths by a few inches at most and scientists admittedly do not know how they are even able to eat with this seemingly prohibitive anatomical arrangement. In fact, experts know very little about the species, period. Strap-toothed whales are distributed throughout cold, temperate waters in the southern hemisphere and are known to strand themselves along beaches in South Africa, Australia, Tasmania, New Zealand, Uruguay, and the Falkland Islands. But they are difficult to approach, according to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. As one of the 21 known beaked whale species, they spend much of their time deep diving in search of food, and it's therefore really rare for humans to spot them. Based on what little exploration into the species has been done, it's known that they eat squid, but a tusked specimen has never been observed eating, so for now, the mystery of how it eats remains just that. Gelada The gelada, also known as the bleeding heart monkey and the gelada baboon, lives in the mountains of Ethiopia and is the only surviving member of its genus. Despite being grass eaters, these primates possess teeth that look capable of committing an outright massacre. They bare their enormous canine teeth through a behavior called a gum-bearing yawn. The practice is most common among high-ranking males, who pull back their upper lip to expose their fearsome fangs, and is often accompanied by a loud call, which researchers believe is a long-distance display, according to BBC Earth's Deadly 60 program. Gum-bearing yawns are thought to be used during tense moments, including right before feeding, suggesting that the behavior is perhaps meant to intimidate other geladas. Females also exhibit yawning displays, but they are used during friendly exchanges. Researchers believe that these behaviors, however alarming they may seem to us humans, may be a complex form of communication meant to deepen the emotional connection between female geladas, or a way for the ladies to express their friendship to one another. Geese In recent years, alarming images of duckbills lined with lots of small, somewhat sharp-looking teeth have circulated on the internet, going viral and sparking widespread shock. They are actually goosebills. These tiny structures that line the interior of goosebills are not exactly teeth, although they serve similar purposes, and are used for things like shredding vegetation and prey. They are made from a bone-hard type of cartilage called tomium, and they grow straight from the beak itself, making them slightly different from actual teeth. The protrusions also lack enamel. In addition to beak teeth, geese also have tongue teeth, which are equally scary looking and are also made from tomium. While the fact that these structures made from cartilage may make the so-called teeth seem less intimidating, they are no less capable of damage than the real thing. As writer Drew Haynes said in a Just Birding article, a goose bite can easily draw blood. And as many people who have had unfortunate encounters with these creatures know, geese are extremely territorial, and they become even more aggressive during mating season, meaning they won't hesitate to chomp down on an offending party. Anyone ever been chased by a goose? They're pretty scary, right? Experts believe that ancient, long-extinct birds may have had teeth, leaving their descendants with the tooth-like formations that we see today. Crab-eater seal The crab-eater seal has a mouthful of teeth that look like buzz saws, or like teeth with lots of tiny additional teeth protruding from them. By the looks of these teeth, as well as the animal's name, it's a fair guess to say that they are shredding some pretty tough crab shells to bits. But Crab-eater seals surprisingly do not eat crabs. Their frightening chompers are adapted for eating microscopic Antarctic krill, acting like a sieve. When a crab-eater seal gulps up a mouthful of water and food, the teeth filter out the krill from the water almost like a strainer. Then the animal swallows whatever is left. The structure works similarly to the baleen of krill-eating whales. 
This feeding method seems to work very well for crab-eater seals, which are considered one of the planet's most abundant mammal species and the most populous type of seal. It seems like no coincidence that the species' teeth are widely regarded as the most specialized in the animal kingdom. Babirusa The four known species of babirusas, also called deer pigs, are native to an area called Wallacea, which encompasses the remote forested Indonesian islands of Sulawesi, Togian, Sula, and Buru. Scientists' knowledge of this enigmatic species, which evolved in isolation, is limited. They do know that babirusas live in large herds, primarily in protected areas. Until 2002, researchers classified them into one species, but they now believe that there are four. The most well-known among them, B. celebensis, lives in Sulawesi, has the characteristically huge tusks, and has very short, fine hair, giving it a naked appearance. These ancient-looking creatures are some of the most bizarre members of the animal kingdom, primarily because of a pair of inward-facing, skin-piercing, curled tusks that males have. The tusks are two upper canine teeth, which actually penetrate up through the snout and curve toward the animal's forehead, making the babirusa the only mammal with vertically growing canines. Its lower canines also grow upward. Sometimes they get so long they can curl over and start poking the top of their head. One of the biggest mysteries about the babirusa is the unknown purpose of its strange tusks. Some, but not all scientists, believe that they are meant to protect the animal from the tusks of other male babirusas. Others disagree, including Darren Naish of Tetrapod Zoology, who noticed that male babirusas box with their hooves rather than by hooking tusks or butting heads. It's possible that the tusks are used for mating, possibly as a sign of genetic fitness to potential mates. But the plain and simple truth is that nobody truly knows what they're for. Narwhal While discussing narwhal teeth in a Smithsonian interview, one dental expert named Martin Nuia summed up his thoughts with this statement, Nothing makes sense. That's because narwhals have no teeth inside their mouths. Their only visible tooth is the so-called horn protruding from their heads that the creatures are so well known for. This spiraled tusk can grow up to nine feet long, and its purpose is unknown. It's one of two horizontally positioned canine teeth that a narwhal has. The left tooth is generally the one that grows into a tusk, erupting through the animal's upper lip. Usually, the right canine tooth remains embedded in a narwhal's skull and measures no more than a foot long. Males and females both have two tusks, but they usually only erupt in males, and it's very rare for both tusks to appear. Narwhals also have a handful of vestigial, in other words, useless teeth, that are located in open sockets near the tusk. These teeth are evidence of a process called evolutionary obsolescence meaning they lost their use over time and therefore do not even develop into useful body parts. With the amount of energy that it takes to produce that one tusk, it could easily have 30 to 40 teeth in its mouth doing other things, Nuia said. Despite having no teeth of practical value, narwhals eat large fish. They simply swallow them whole instead of chewing. In 2017, drone footage of a narwhal using its tusk to stun Arctic cod partially solved the mystery of how these creatures use this strange, elongated tooth. But researchers believe the animals may have other uses for their tusks and are still trying to determine what they might be. Naked Mole Rat This little guy is just creepy and ugly. Poor thing, can't help it. The burrowing rodent known as the Naked Mole Rat lives its entire life underground, meaning it's rarely seen by humans. But anyone lucky enough, or unfortunate enough, depending on how you look at it, to catch a glimpse of one of these homely, nearly hairless creatures probably notices its large buck teeth before anything else. These four teeth, two upper and two lower, function independently, with the specimen capable of controlling and moving one at a time. The naked mole rat's teeth are powered by the animal's strong jaws, which account for an astounding 25% of its muscle mass. But this is not the only shocking characteristic about the creatures, which boast several unique traits. For example, naked mole rats are one of just two mammal species that live in eusocial colonies, which are highly organized, complex societies that engage in group decision-making and reproductive division of labor, meaning that not all members procreate and cooperative care of offspring. Colonies revolve around a queen, a role which females compete for by fighting one another to the death, using their enormous teeth to puncture their opponent's lungs and other vital organs. 
Despite this fatal fighting, naked mole rats often live into their 30s, making them especially unique among small rodents who generally do not live more than a few years at most. Thanks for watching! Makes your teeth feel pretty awesome right now, doesn't it? Be sure to take care of your chompers! What were your favorite animal teeth? Let me know in the comments below, and remember to subscribe if you haven't already! See you soon! Bye!